tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The snow was just so deep and I was so exhausted. I, I didn't have food. A BC skier lost for two days and his remarkable tale of survival. We're seeing decreases in assessed values, up, upwards to 15% this year. Why have Metro Vancouver property values dropped also? It added a lot of money to my bottom line. As MSP premiums disappear, BC businesses struggle to make up the difference. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. It's an emotional goodbye for the family of a young taxi driver killed early Sunday morning. Sinepal Singh Rindawa's parents have arrived from India to mourn their son who died after a car to go collided with his taxi. As Mira Baines reports, family and friends are raising money to help pay for his funeral. <laughs> The parents of Sanipal Rindawa arrived from India over the weekend to say goodbye to their son. Rindawa's mother is inconsolable. Friends and family say 28-year-old Rindawa was working hard as a yellow cab driver to get his life established in Canada, but died in a fatal collision at First Avenue and Renfrew Street early Sunday morning. <laughs> His father says for a family, there can be no bigger pain than this. Rindawa moved from Punjab, India to Canada 10 years ago, and friends say he had purchased a new home. They joined Rindawa's family in mourning. He was one of the generous, humorous guy. I can't explain about that guy. He's always willing to help each and everybody. He's always there for you, no matter what time. They are raising money to help his parents with expenses. Well, later on, money, all the funds will be given to the parents, and then it's their wish how they'd like to remember his son and how they'd like to use the money. It appears the car-to-go driver, a man in his 20s, may have T-boned the taxi after running a red light, according to police. Police have said the car-to-go driver may have evaded officers at a roadblock before the collision. No charges have been laid. Vancouver police said today that the driver of the car-to-go is still in hospital in critical condition. He is unable to speak to police, so an interview has not been conducted. A VPD spokesperson added, it's a very complex investigation and will take some time. Rindawa's family and friends say the crash should have never happened. This was preventable and he should have been here right now. And if that person didn't decide to get behind the wheel that day, our friend, our brother, he would be here with us. The funeral will be held next Wednesday. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. A BC skier is recounting his harrowing tale of survival tonight from his hospital bed. He says he nearly gave up on being rescued during his two days in the backcountry near Trail and was ready to let nature take its course. But as Dan Burrett reports, the thought of Mark Gajowski's family gave him the willpower to fight on. A mother's hug. Mark Gajowski didn't think he would get one of those again. I thought I was going to die out there. The 34-year-old hit the slopes of Red Mountain Resort on Monday morning, then planned to glide to a friend's condo on the mountain, then watch Star Wars that afternoon. On his final run, he ventured down a tempting out-of-bounds trail. It turned to thick trees. Snow was dumping down. And it started getting dark out. Mark's phone died. His own breath was his only source of heat. I didn't have a lighter, I didn't have anything. He did have 10 teams of search and rescue crews combing the dangerous backcountry trying to find him. Gajowski was soaking wet with no gloves. The snow was just so deep and I was so exhausted. I, I didn't have food. Despair was close. I had almost made a decision to give up at that point and just sit there and let nature keep its course. But he kept moving. After two nights outdoors, he was furious. He was hearing and seeing things in his exhaustion. Turns out, he wasn't hallucinating. I started yelling and they were yelling back. And then after a few minutes of that, I realized that they, there was somebody there. Rescuers reached him, warmed him up, and choppered him back to the resort. Just feeling really grateful for um, search and rescue and for everything I have for the, the community that we have here. Gajowski's body and pride are covered in bruises, but he will hit the mountain again and do more. 
I'm going to try and volunteer for search and rescue after this, for sure. And for sure, more prepared. Dan Burritt, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, dip in home assessments was expected this year, but that anticipated dip has turned out to be a plunge. As Estefania Duran reports, residential property values across Metro Vancouver are down by as much as 15%. For the first time in 20 years, the province's total property assessment value has gone down. This year, the, the decreases are a bit greater, and both single-family dwellings and stratas are moving in the same way this year. So is this good or bad? Depends who you're asking. I think if you're a homeowner, you might be a little bit discouraged because, you know, technically you can look at that and say, well, my, my net worth is lower. And realistically, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get a tax break. He says the drop is good news for buyers, but those who bought a pre-sale might also be in for a shock. Most lenders are going to reappraise you and um, reapprove you when you go to close on these units. And so if the valuations have changed from what you paid, then yeah, sometimes there is going to be difficulties getting financing. Values are calculated by looking at the sales of similar properties around July 1st every year. Property characteristics, land size and location also play a role. West Vancouver saw the biggest drop in single-family home values at 15.9%, followed by Richmond with a 12.9% drop, then Vancouver down 12.1%. But whether or not a decrease in value will result in lower property taxes, that depends on your neighbours. If your assessment goes down 10% and your neighbour's assessment goes down 5%, there's likely a good chance that you're going to see a reduction in your property taxes. But if others in your community see a similar decrease, you'll be stuck with the same property taxes. As to why home values have gone down... I think there's like so many factors that it's probably hard to pinpoint. Uh, I mean, we can talk about government regulations and policies that were ultimately designed to, to sort of curb demand and ultimately lower prices. So. Uh, I think those have played a part. Some of those measures include foreign home buyers tax, as well as the speculation and empty homes tax. Those unhappy with their assessment can submit an appeal by the end of the month. Estefania Duran, CBC News, Vancouver. So that's the shape of things here in Metro Vancouver, but things are changing across the province. And to look at that, we bring in our Justin McElroy. So Justin, where are some of the noticeable drops and increases elsewhere? Yeah, Anita, we talked a lot about the drops that happened in Metro Vancouver, but once you get out of that area, it's a bit of a different picture. You look at the major population centers in the rest of British Columbia, and things were pretty stable. Some places a little bit down, some places a little bit up, but take a look right there. Kamloops up 6.5%, Prince George 5%, Victoria just over 1%, Kelowna a drop of about 1%, pretty stable. And there were also places that had huge increases, including Kitimat at 36%, Queen Charlotte at 24%, Terrace at 26, 20%. Kitimat and Terrace probably because of the $40 billion LNG project that's currently under construction. So you can always look at the biggest city and take one story away, but depending on where, where you are in the province, it might be a slightly more optimistic take if you're a homeowner. No kidding. Okay, so with all of this in mind, provincially and, and just in Metro Vancouver, what's in store for 2020? Does this change anything? Yeah, and that's a more difficult question to answer. The Minister of Housing for British Columbia, Selena Robinson, certainly applauded the news today, saying in a statement that it was a positive sign of uh, the government's efforts to make housing more affordable for more British Columbians. Of course, they put in a bunch of different taxes and regulations on housing over the past two years, and 2019 was the first year that took full effect. As for what the market holds next year, you know, or this year, I should say, we've talked to a number of people over the past few weeks and they say it's hard to really predict at this point because there's no new government policies coming on board that we know of at this point. Mortgage rules have uh, been made a little bit easier as well and the market has taken into account a lot of the changes that have already been made. So no matter what happens, we'll probably be talking housing a lot over the next year, but harder to say that there's going to be the same downturn that we saw in 2019. People here love to talk housing. Justin, thank you. Thanks, Anita. Okay, saying goodbye to MSP premiums might come as a relief to some, but as Tina Lovegreen explains, some BC businesses say a new tax which replaces those payments is hurting their bottom line. Rufus Guitar Shop has been around since the 1980s. 
It's where you can find everything from acoustic to vintage guitars. This is one of the rarest guitars in the world. It's kind of crazy that this is in here. But owner Blaine McNamee says the province's employer health tax is hurting his bottom line and his employees. Right, it's, it's a tax that affects our bottom line, which affects our profitability, which affects extra money we have to give raises. The tax replaces the MSP charges, which were usually paid by individuals. When the tax cut was announced, the government said it would save people as much as $900 a year. But businesses with payrolls greater than half a million dollars have to pay a replacement tax to make up for the lost revenue. For McNamee, that's $10,000 a year, and that number will go up if he hires more employees. So it prevents me from creating more jobs. MSP premiums were eliminated in the new year, but businesses have been paying the new tax since June. It has been impacting them already. This would have been in December the third payment that they've made so far and 50% of the MSP was still collected as, uh, during that time. So there was a bit of a double dipping happening. She says small businesses face a number of challenges already and the tax is just adding to the pile and preventing them from growing. They're putting caps on pay raises. They're reconsidering whether or not to hire. You know, they have less money to reinvest in their business. They have less money to reinvest in, you know, charitable causes and other things they care about in their communities. She says some shop owners might go through a hiring freeze or raise their prices to make up for the tax. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. A man is dead and another is in custody tonight after a fight in Surrey early this morning. Police say multiple witnesses saw it all unfold in a parking lot on 75A Avenue and Scott Road just before 1 a.m. When officers arrived, they found a man dead. The 33-year-old suspect had left the scene, but he was arrested soon after with the help of a bystander who followed him and updated officers with his location. We would never uh, recommend somebody put their own uh, safety in danger. Uh, in this instance, uh, the male took it upon himself to, uh, to follow, and it sounds like uh, uh, he did so from a safe enough distance that, uh, that he was able to ensure he, he would be safe while doing so. And he just passed on his, his observations to police, which were um, very beneficial to our investigation. Police say the suspect has no known ties to gang activity. Charges have yet to be laid, and anyone with information is asked to call IHIT or Crime Stoppers. Time now to go to Brett Sauter, home who we sent outside in hopes that you might get a little rain on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're getting partially what you asked for. There's a little bit of rain right now. I do have a trusty umbrella with me, but it's definitely not as much of a downpour as perhaps it was earlier on in the day or even how much it's going to be over the next 24 hours or so. It really is going to be a rainy system coming on shore. And I want to show you where it's coming from. This is going to be a live look at our satellite and radar. This is what is called an atmospheric river. If you look to the bottom left of your screen, screen there, that's like a conveyor belt of moisture coming up from the tropics and and it is just going to be bringing an impressive amount of rain to not only the lower mainland, but really to the entire coast of BC. And if we zoom in a little bit more, I can show you what's going on closer to home. You can see it's not necessarily falling very, very heavily toward this area. However, there were some places as well that weren't just dealing with rain, but actually some snow. And I want to show you what that looked like. This was earlier today, taken along Campbell River, near Campbell River. This would be Highway 19. And definitely the temperatures there were cold enough to allow for snow to be falling. But that is, of course, not going to be too much of a concern for us here down at sea level. Temperatures at this point in time, pretty chilly, still hovering around three degrees or so. But as we go ahead to the next 12 hours, what I do want to pass along is that it will be warming up oddly enough throughout the overnight tonight. We could be dealing with temperatures near eight degrees by essentially tomorrow morning. And when I come back inside, I will warm up and give you that full forecast. All right. Thanks, Brett. Grouse Mountain Resort has been sold for the second time in less than three years. This time bought by Northland properly, properties rather owned by Vancouver's Gallardi family. The resort has suffered recently from warm winters and long gondola waits. Northland property says its short-term plan is to improve the existing infrastructure and resort staff say the replacement of the blue tram gondola is still a priority. Northland also owns Sandman Hotel Group, Shark Club, the Dallas Stars and Denny's Restaurants.
Australia's already extreme fire risk is expected to dangerously intensify this weekend. And that sparked a mass exodus order in parts of New South Wales, where they've now issued a state of disaster. Those who can leave struggle today to make their way to relative safety in Sydney and Canberra. The chaos has generated 30 kilometres worth of gridlock in some places. More Canadian firefighters are now there assisting with emergency efforts, bringing the number to 87. Tanya Fletcher spoke with a fire crew leader from British Columbia about what he's seeing. <laughs> Australia's raging wildfires triggered an international call for help, and Canada was quick to answer. But this is the first time we've mobilized at a national level and come to Australia. We're pretty much all over the state right now. Glenn Burgess is starting a month-long stint heading up the rotating crews from Canada, based in Sydney. Canada's deployment to Australia is part of an agreement between the two countries to exchange resources in times of crisis. He'll lead an incident management team that will provide support and expertise to those on the front lines. Uh, about 50 staff deployed to the field, um, and they're in a variety of roles, doing operations, logistics, plans, um, heavy equipment, we call it back home, they call it heavy plant here. Techniques may be similar, but the terrain different. From terminology to schedules, he says there are adjustments to be made and lessons to be learned. Things as simple as work rest patterns and shift patterns are different here, so we're looking at that and those are certainly things we'll take home and think about, you know, you always want to take what you've learned that's better and maybe try to adopt it back home. But the demand for their skills is not about to subside. The weekend forecast has winds picking up and temperatures on the rise along Australia's south coast, meaning the fire danger could heighten even further. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And just a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. A BC teen is lucky to be alive after falling 150 metres off an icy mountain in Oregon. After the break, the remarkable story of survival. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us on our live stream where of course we are ad free during the regular TV commercial break. Okay, yesterday marked the 100th polar bear swim. So for throwback Thursday, we're going back 35 years to hear about why it all began straight from a friend who helped start it all. Former CBC reporter Karen Webb has the story. The beaches of English Bay were covered in snow, which made it one of the few New Year's Days in Vancouver when there really were polar bear conditions for the annual polar bear swim. The cold temperatures didn't keep the crowds away. But it was probably why there were only 1,700 of the city's hardiest and foolhardiest waiting eagerly at the starting line, compared to the more than 2,000 last year. For some, polar bear swimming is not just a New Year's event. Swimming placidly with the others was Harry Kovish. He thinks nothing of a winter dip in the Pacific. I think of myself as a real polar bear. Harry has been swimming since the 40s. He goes back to the days when there were only a few polar bears. They went swimming on New Year's Day to show how fit they were, not how drunk. As an old timer, he doesn't think much of new timers. They get tanked up with a few drinks for uh, some little artificial stimulation and uh, they get in up to their waist or knees or someplace and they jump out and um, then they stand there shivering and uh, so on and it's, uh, they're not, I don't think they're just really genuine polar bears. They're swimmers. It was easy to see most of today's swimmers weren't regulars, but amid the sensation seekers there were a few more like Harry. They were the ones who weren't shivering. Tell me what the water's like, oh, Harry. It's not bad. It's cold. Fingers tingle a bit. How do you feel? Oh, great, great. I told you, it, it really wakes you up. The swimmers got out very quickly. Most simply couldn't stay in the three-degree ocean. In fact, one voted for on the water rather than in. And this year, there was no point in hanging around to brag about a balmy BC winter that wasn't. And the polar bear swim just keeps growing and growing. Yesterday was also a success here in Vancouver. All right, stay with us. We'll be back with what's making headlines across the country in just a few moments.
A Surrey teen is recovering in a U.S. hospital tonight. He's injured, but given what he's injured, he's alive and relatively well. Now, he fell about 150 meters off an icy mountain in Oregon. He told the CBC's Olivia Stefanovic how he managed to survive. This was 16-year-old Gerba Singh's mission, scaling Oregon's highest peak. But instead of reaching the summit, he was taken off in a stretcher. It happened so fast, I'm just processing all of it right now. Singh set off for the top of Mount Hood early Monday with friends. Conditions clear, he was just below the final push, in an area called the Pearly Gates, when he slipped on a broken piece of ice, sending him 150 meters straight down. Instinctively, I was just trying to stop myself. Like, I was fighting for my life, basically. Singh says he tried to keep his knees up, but his foot got caught fracturing his leg. Singh landed in what's known as the Devil's Kitchen, a section of the dormant volcano surrounded by cliffs. There, he waited hours in the cold for rescue. I'm so thankful for everyone who helped me and like, they, they kept me awake and they just held my mood because it hurt a lot. Even though the route Singh was taken wasn't extremely technical, the mountain has seen more than 130 deaths. It's not uncommon for people to fall and, and, and be killed um, up there. Climber Chris Bremer knows the risks well. He's ascended Mount Hood 10 times, even with his teenage son. You just need to do enough um, that, that you're comfortable um, in snow and ice, um, that you understand the risks, um, and hopefully you understand um, whether you're in over your head or, um, or, or what you're doing is something that's within your skill set. Singh says he knew what he was getting into. This would have been his 98th summit. He documents his journeys on social media, where he's known as Teen Mountaineer. It makes me feel happy, like, like I've conquered something bigger than myself. Singh plans to ease back into the sport. He says it will take six weeks until he can fully put weight back on his left leg. And then there will be more mountains to climb. Olivia Stevanovich, CBC News, Toronto. A high-profile CEO officially became an international fugitive today. Interpol's red notice list now includes Carlos Goan, former head of Nissan. He slipped out of Tokyo and surfaced in Beirut. Carolyn Dunn explains how the powerful fugitive may now be beyond the reach of prosecutors. A media frenzy outside Carlos Ghosn's Beirut home. Every car swarmed, every visitor grilled, even a physician for Ghosn's wife. Just I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician. The fugitive CEO is believed to be holed up here, while investigators from Japan to Turkey tried to piece together his brazen escape, seizing evidence today from Ghosn's Tokyo home. Gone, once considered a rock star auto executive for turning around the financial fortunes of Nissan, fell from grace under allegations he swindled tens of millions of dollars from the car manufacturer to fund a lavish lifestyle. Gone, seen here dressed as a construction worker to evade the media during his trial in Tokyo, may have used his power of disguise to slip out of Japan, stunning and angering even his own legal team. It was an unexpected surprise, he says. I'm shocked and confused, noting his legal team had his passports under lock and key. Last spring, Gone claimed the case against him was all a setup. This is about a plot. This is about conspiracies. This is about backstabbing. Ghosn insists he's fled injustice and political persecution. Whether criminal mastermind or victim, 
He may be home free because he holds three citizenships. First in Lebanon, which says he entered legally with a spare French passport. It has no extradition treaty with Japan. Then in France, whose foreign minister confirmed it will be a safe haven for Ghosn. We would not extradite Mr. Ghosn, she says. France never extradites its citizens. Finally, Brazil, which also has no extradition treaty with Japan. Meaning Carlos Ghosn, the international escape artist, could hide in plain sight from Japanese authorities. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, London. Suspended after being accused by former players of physical and verbal abuse. Former Canucks head coach Mark Crawford is back behind the bench tonight in Vancouver with the Blackhawks. What he's saying after the break. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. 
I guess it's no surprise that the you know, years of significant increases that we've seen in the past can't continue, so we are returning to a more balanced, stable market. Residential property values have fallen in Metro Vancouver. Detached houses and condos decreasing by up to 15% according to BC assessment. Homes in West Vancouver dropped the most, followed by Richmond and Vancouver, Surrey and Langley dropping the least. I just told my father I was going to die out there. A BC skier is recounting his harrowing tale of survival tonight from his hospital bed. At one point during his two days in the backcountry near Trail, Mark Gajowski says he nearly gave up on being rescued and was ready to let nature take its course. But he says the thought of his family gave him the willpower to fight on. And Grouse Mountain Resort has again been sold. Northland Properties, owned by the Gallardi family, has made the purchase. The company also owns Sandman Hotel Group, Moxie's, Denny's, and the Dallas Stars hockey team. It's expected Grouse will now see renovations in the coming years. Well, when the Canucks set to host the Blackhawks in just under half an hour, a controversial figure will be behind the visitors bench. Chicago's assistant coach, Mark Crawford, is seeing his first action in a month. He was suspended and investigated following physical and verbal abuse allegations from former players on past teams. Tanya Fletcher caught up with him before tonight's game. I'm very sorry. Uh, I, uh, I wish it, uh, those things didn't happen. Words of remorse from Mark Crawford as he returned to the ice. The Blackhawks investigated and today welcomed him back. It's definitely a presence we've missed uh, for a little while now, so we're, we're happy to, to have him back. Crawford was put on leave in early December after players spoke out about physical abuse during previous coaching jobs. There was a lot of things that, that I saw and that, that uh, weren't, you know, proper in, in that direction. Corey Hirsch played for the Vancouver Canucks in the late 90s when Crawford was head coach. He did some things that um, I didn't like personally, um, but, you know, that's uh, a lot of guys did. And that's, um, you know, that's not giving him an excuse. That's to say, you know what, if you were one of those coaches or one of those people in the past, go and get yourself some help. And get help he did. The team says Crawford has been going to counselling on a regular basis since 2010. Today, he says he knows he crossed a line. Yeah, there's some uh, some regrets, and you got to face your regrets, and you've uh, got to uh, be honourable. And there have been several similar allegations across the NHL. After the Toronto Maple Leafs fired head coach Mike Babcock, several players came out with allegations of verbal abuse. And former Calgary Flames head coach Bill Peters resigned after former players spoke out about physical abuse and his use of a racist slur. It sparked calls for a shift in hockey culture. Help teach the younger coaches. Help teach the coaches who are in on the rinks with the kids that the best way to teach is not through threatening and scaring and motivating that way. It's, it's not acceptable now. We're in a generation where these players are demanding to be treated better, and rightfully so. Lessons Crawford says he's learned and will carry forward. So as long as you stay sensitive to people's feelings and you stay sensitive to uh, the process, then I think good will happen from it. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. What a beautiful night up there. You're looking at a live shot of Whistler. Now, despite 2020 starting off with some sunshine, we return to a very soggy pattern. Brett has more after the break.
Right now, more than 8 million Australians are under a state of emergency. The death toll from wildfires is now at 18. The CBC's Salima Shivji has more on those trying to flee before the fires get even worse. The crush to get out by any escape route that's still open after out of control flames destroyed home after home. There's no supplies, there's, the sewage is just about to its limit. So what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Officials say prepare for even worse. We strongly advise you to leave now. This is what an emergency looks like. It's not safe to stay put. In some areas, supplies are running out. So is fuel. Yeah, it's a, yeah mum it, wants to stay, but I don't know. Oh, it's just, it's just a scary feeling, I think. Just, just everything that's going on. For thousands stranded in the beach town of Malakuta, the only way out is with the help of the Navy. Crowds waited last night to see if they made the list, anxious to be the first to leave for safer shores. With so many wildfires still burning out of control, <coughs> this magpie learned to imitate fire sirens. Thick smoke is drifting far, cities at the mercy of which direction the wind blows. Parks and libraries closed to push people indoors, but even there, little relief. I thought the conditions would be fine inside, but, but they're not really. It's still pretty um, awful. For so many like this couple, it's been a difficult few days. The land scorched, but their home withstood the flames, even as the one next door burned. I cried really? as I turned the corner because I saw my house that was still there from the front, and I started to cry. I was that happy it was still there. It wasn't luck. Before taking shelter, he prepared his home. We expect another catastrophic day on uh, Saturday. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I did the first time. I'm, I've got the gutter plugs in, I'll hose the roof down again, all the external windows, deck, and go. Taking action to keep hope alive. Salima Shipji, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, the pictures coming out of Australia are alarming, but so too are the numbers. Wildfires burning all over the country, about 200 in New South Wales and Victoria alone. And most of those along the densely populated coastal stretch. And the loss is huge. At least 1,400 homes have been destroyed, land the size of Nova Scotia charred. Summer is just starting, spreading further than the flames is that smoke and ash. In fact, this is a glacier in New Zealand. Snow and ice blanketed in brown. And with the fire crisis comes a political one, too. Ellen Morrow has more about the anger being directed at Australia's Prime Minister today. Scott Morrison set out for a prime ministerial moment on the fire's front lines. Instead, rejection, a firefighter refusing the prime minister's handshake. And from this woman... I'm only shaking your hand if you give more funding to our IRS. No welcome for Morrison, only scorn. We are totally forgotten about down here. Every Other residents heckled the prime minister. Hey, come back! You're not welcome! Until he drove away. I understand the very strong feelings people have. They've, they've lost everything and uh, there are still, you know, some very d dangerous days ahead. For weeks, Morrison has been criticized by his political opponents and those who say his climate policies are partly to blame for the fires. Their record is abysmal. These politicians are just not in touch with the reality of what is happening with the abrupt climate change. Not so, says the Prime Minister. Well, Australia is, is carrying its load. Carry, Australia is meeting the challenge better than most countries. But data shows Australia is not on track to meet its carbon emissions targets under the Paris Climate Agreement. The country is the world's top exporter of coal. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasure. be scared. With Morrison once brandishing a lump of it in Parliament. His position is quite precarious right now. This journalist says the fires and the growing backlash could force change. These bushfires could, in a few years' time, we might look back on them as, I guess, a catalyst for and admission of uh, climate change in this country. But for now, the danger remains with no end in sight. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto.
right? Mm -hmm. Very different from Australia's situation. Okay. We are getting a bit of a storm tonight. Quite the storm. I really wish we could be giving some of the rain that we're mm -hmm. going to be getting over to Australia. They definitely could use it, whereas for us, it might just be a little bit more of an inconvenience. But I do want to stress, this is the potential, really, for some localized flooding here, so something to be keeping in mind. But let's take a look first thing at what it was like this morning. It's actually a nice change of pace. Instead of looking like you're going through a car wash, you could actually see those beautiful North Shore mountains. You can see those cranes in action as well, doing their thing. Everything kind of getting back to normal, as it were, even though it's this still weird post-holiday period for many of us. But somehow tomorrow is Friday, and the weekend is almost here. But it is going to be a fairly soggy one, and I did want to walk you through some of the warnings that have been issued by Environment Canada at this time. Anything in green here, you can see this is a rainfall warning. Predominantly, this is going to be a Vancouver and west, or Vancouver and north and west, I should say. We are looking at anywhere between 60 and 90 millimeters of rain accumulating, but we're not alone in this. All of Vancouver Island, essentially on high alert as well, upwards of 150 millimeters could be falling for places like Tofino. And we already saw that snow over toward Campbell River and more is in the forecast. And on that note, far to the north as well, 15 to 30 centimeters and a winter storm warning for places like Terrace and Kitimat. So truly, this is a province-wide story right now and something that has got every meteorologist's attention at this point in time. In terms of the timing for our rain, I want to walk you through this. We are going to be seeing some periods of heavy rain throughout the overnight. Tomorrow afternoon, we might get lulled into this false sense of security, thinking it's over, but just wait until this time tomorrow, about 24 hours from now. Some heavy rain in the forecast for that, and it is going to be carrying on even through the weekend, though a little bit less at times. One major thing here to mention, we haven't covered this just yet, we are looking at strong winds tomorrow coming from the south or the southeast. So for Boundary Bay, places like White Rock, we could be seeing local gusts up to about 70 kilometers an hour tomorrow evening, so something to keep in mind. And lastly, sea to sky right now, in terms of our avalanche danger rating, it doesn't get higher than this. It is extreme, so do not go out into the backcountry, even if it is tempting. Now, our five-day forecast, you're going to notice no sun in the icon whatsoever, but what you will see is that Friday, our daytime highs, this is going to be very mild. We're looking at temperatures about 10 degrees, and then for the remainder of the weekend and getting into next week, we'll be fluctuating around those seasonal temperatures, but keep those umbrellas handy, because you're certainly going to be needing them. All right, thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, the hope is third time's the charm for India's space program. <laughs> the country will attempt a third mission to the moon. The announcement comes just months after a previous effort ended with a crash landing. If successful, this time India will become just the fourth country after the U.S., Russia and China to make a successful lunar landing. Well, more than 50 percent of infants are exceeding their daily sugar intake. How is it happening and why after the break?
Most parents with infants and toddlers try to steer clear of foods filled with added sugar. But researchers say babies as young as six months are still eating them. Health reporter Christine Birak has more on which baby foods are the worst and how to avoid them. Hi, guys. Hi. Do you want a little bit? Hey. 11-month-old twins Come Sam on. and Jake Love here are out. pretty good eaters. So is their big sister, yeah. Noelle. They all need small bites of nutritious food. What they don't need is someone adding sugar to sweeten that food. But researchers say it's happening. So sometimes it can sneak into foods that we don't always expect to see it in. A recent study found nearly two-thirds of infants and almost all toddlers are eating added sugars. Problem is, early eating habits in life often shape later eating patterns. Research has shown too much added sugar is associated with cavities, asthma, obesity, high blood pressure, and cholesterol issues. This was 18 grams in this. And experts know yes. in part what's feeding their sweet tooth. You, uh... In the last 30 or so years, we have seen a real increase in this idea that kids need their own kinds of foods, right? That there's aisles now that are, here's baby food, here's toddler food, here's transition food. The top food sources of added sugars for infants included yogurts, baby snacks, and sweet bakery products. For toddlers, throw in fruit drinks. And it's not always easy to tell from the label. There are over 100 different names used for sugar. Uh, we have sugar. We have sugar syrup. Uh, I think corn and barley malt extract may also be sugar. To help shoppers, as of January 1st, American food makers now identify the amount of total and added sugars on food products. Health Canada decided against that approach. Instead, it's asking companies to list all sugars together on the label and offer a percent daily value. And the reason that's helpful is then we can say to folks, if it has less than 5% of your daily value, that's a low in sugar product. Mm -hmm. And if it has greater than 15% of the uh, daily value, that's a product high in sugar. Canadians will have to wait until 2022 for those new sugar labels. Perfect. But for parents, okay. it's a daily struggle. Ideally, your kids won't develop such a strong sense of urgency for eating sugar all the time, except at Halloween. <laughs> Their family strategy is to eat together and cook as many healthy meals as possible. But in a busy household like this one, sometimes a little baby snack can go a long way. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. A new groundbreaking study shows AI is as good as expert radiologists at detecting breast cancer. It might even be better. The CBC's Alana Petroff looks at what this might mean for the future of patient care. Medical researchers say they were surprised and impressed at how artificial intelligence could pinpoint breast cancer. This is a skill that can take mere mortals years to learn. The study found that an artificial intelligence system was better at spotting cancer than a single doctor working alone. It wasn't perfect, but researchers said that with AI, there was a significant improvement. The study worked with dozens of doctors and researchers in the U.S. and the U.K. These individuals worked with Google Health to train an artificial intelligence system to spot breast cancer in mammograms. Let's take a look at some of the results and key figures. In this study, the AI system was used in the U.S. and there was a 9.4% reduction in false negatives. That means doctors missed the cancer sometimes, but with AI, they spotted cancer 9.4% more. And in the U.K., the AI system led to a 2.7% reduction in false negatives. That means they spotted cancer nearly 3% more. A doctor in the U.S. who is part of this research says the study showed how AI could help medical professionals. Unfortunately, like most diagnostic tests, are not perfect and can't always catch the cancer. Uh, in fact, according to the American Cancer Society, up to one in five women can have their cancer missed on a mammogram. Uh, using these tools allows clinicians to have significantly more free time to concentrate on what we all went to medical school for, which is to actually take care of patients. Doctors are hoping a new diagnosis system which incorporates AI could mean more accurate results and shorter waiting times for patients to get their diagnoses. Alana Petroff, CBC News, London. A Canadian group is using hockey to build a relationship with people halfway around the world. Where? 
That's coming up. Friday, on the early edition, a conference aimed at empowering young girls and teaching them self-confidence is coming to Vancouver this weekend. We'll speak with the founder behind the new conference, Friday, on the early edition. Well, it's called the Hermit Kingdom. North Korea is a secretive country that keeps tight control on both its citizens and foreign visitors. But a group of Canadians were able to close some of that gap with cameras, friendship, and hockey. We're going to pretend we're part of the, uh, the North Korean military marching band. Yeah. <laughs> this is a moment years in the making. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the Whistler Film Festival debut of a documentary set in a place that in so many ways is so far away from here. Okay, we gotta take a photo here. This group from Vancouver spent months making the movie and years building a relationship with North Korea. I started in 2008, 2009, uh, working there. I had Matt Reichel has made an astonishing 50 trips to the country. I mean, for me personally, it's part of my journey with North Korea. Uh, it's 10 years now, and it's all about trying to close the gap. I mean, literally, the movie's called that. It all led to this. A film crew getting what Reichel describes as unprecedented access to the North Korean team as it headed to an international tournament. The Canadian cameras couldn't stray too far from the rink in the capital of Pyongyang. And the North Korean players didn't stray too far from the party line in the documentary. We are a socialist country, he says, that carries the banner of independence and peaceful, amicable relations. 
But still, the filmmakers felt they had a level of independence that might seem surprising in a dictatorship notorious for censorship and ruthless control. This was really just us in the sports department and hockey. And, you know, we had a government guy with us for the first two days of shoot. And then they're like, all right, go ahead. Like, you're in the stadium, you're hanging with the players. Go talk about what you want. And I think the players are really good at self-censoring. And when they're on camera, they, they see a big camera with foreigners and they say, oh man, like, I got to talk pretty, pretty party line. But when we're hanging out with them, there's no cameras around, they don't talk about that stuff. That's not to say they negate it. It's just like, for them, they want to talk about their family and their kids and their babies and like what's going on and the new skates and what's going on in the world of hockey. They're hockey players just like people are here. But is there a danger in making North Korea seem just like here? After all, Human Rights Watch describes it as one of the world's most repressive states that uses torture and executions to control its population. I asked Reichel how he'd respond if people felt his film is naive or even worse, propaganda. People are entitled to their opinion. I would love to talk about all those elements. I've worked in humanitarianism in North Korea. I've worked in education there. I have really close friends in that country. And for me, it's just, it's just a deeply personal journey. There are limits to the access. We don't see the players in their homes, for example. <laughs> but you do get some sense of their personalities. Every time I go back, it's you're just engaging a deeper level of friendship with them. And For one of the filmmakers, this project drew him closer to his roots. Sonny Ham grew up in Vancouver, but one of his grandparents was from North Korea. He talked about it in this behind-the-scenes video. Being the heritage background that I have is very... <laughs> very uh, eye-opening, and um, it was great to see that there's so much connection through just one sport. To the extent hockey can tell us about a country's culture, the Canadians did see how the game in North Korea reflects decades behind an iron curtain. Their ice hockey or their playing abilities have been sort of frozen in time because a lot of their materials, like the trainings and the skills and the, like the playbooks that they have, is literally passed down from a lot of the, the back in the Soviet Union, like the USSR days. Um, some new materials that they have right now, but they're still trying to understand the fundamentals around the game. That may be the motivation for the North Koreans, getting Canadians to help bring hockey into the modern age. But for Rai Shell, the goal of these trips and this film is to create personal connections between the two countries. How do you help people shift perspective and, and move the debate away from the politics? That's always in the background, and we know that. And I don't want to diminish the politics, but I do want to say, like, there's, there's people here, and we're people, and we can connect over things that are more apolitical and kind of just start to learn about each other and break down those walls. And that has helped inspire Reichel's next big thing. And so we were trying to think of how do we kind of create a project that can interact with North Koreans. At this Korean restaurant in Vancouver, a group of adventuresome recreational hockey players have come to learn about the Pyongyang Cup next May. Canadian men and women playing alongside North Koreans in a small tournament. Most of your normal travel insurance will not cover North Korea. Raichel doesn't sugarcoat it. This is no ordinary road trip. Because the medical care in North Korea is not fantastic. Some people have already signed up. I think it's just because it's North Korea. Like, I've always been interested in it, right? You know, I've always liked hockey. And I think the combination of the two is just going to be sick. We'll see whether that gets lost in translation. But if the Pyongyang Cup goes ahead... I'm pretty jazzed up right now. I've never played ice hockey in DPRK. It appears North Korea is about to get a taste of Canadian hockey culture on and off the ice. Very cool, that report from the Nationals' Ian Hanamansing. And you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Burrett will be back here at 11 o'clock after the National with your next local news. Have a good night.